وغادر اليوم وانا مرتاح الضمير Good afternoon and thank you for watching us on Future TV. I'm Linda Kameen and these are today's top stories. Interior Minister Madwan Shedbil says he needs six months of preparations for the polls if there was no consensus on a new law. The military appeals court orders to release on bail of a man suspect, suspected of involvement in a deadly attack on the army in Arsel. And fighting between Syria's rebels and loyalist troops rage in two Damascus neighborhoods. Interior Minister Marwan Sherbil has refrained from revealing the time frame for a postponement of the parliamentary elections. During a visit to the General Directorate of the Internal Security Forces in Ashrafiyya, Sherbil says he needed six months of preparations for the polls if there was consensus on a new law. He mentioned he had prepared for the elections based on the 1960 law over a failure by the rival blocs to agree on a new draft law to govern the polls next June. Shadwell stressed, however, that no draft law would be adopted in the absence of consensus among the parties concerned. He also hoped for unity away from politics and sectarianism to serve the citizens. The minister called for the quick formation of a new government to appoint the new ISF director general. Heads of clans in the Lebanese border area of Wadi Khalid urged President Michel Sleiman and General Security Chief Brigadier General Abbas Brahim to negotiate the release of Mohammed Al Ahmed with the Syrian authorities. Eight Syrian Alawites were kidnapped from their minibus at the Jisr Ma'ir border crossing in Wadi Khalid on their way to Syria. The men were abducted in retaliation for the disappearance of Al Ahmed, who went missing on Syria, in Syria more than a year ago. Ali Fahad Al Ahmed, who read the statement, pointed out that the clans denounced any kidnapping attempts and added the clans considered the disappearance of Al Ahmed as a humanitarian case. For his part, Al Hishi municipality chief Daham Al Naif says that the kidnapped Alawites are held at the house of Hussein Muhammad Al Ahmed. He noted that the Lebanese state is responsible for negotiating the release process with the Syrian authority. Lebanese President Michel Sleiman calls for the denunciation of the recent abductions in Lebanon. During a meeting with clans from Baalbek, Sleiman said that the law must prevail and serve to unify Lebanon. The president also stressed the importance of not having counter-reactions to allow the authorities to make efforts to release the, abdu the abductee. Late March, the abductors of a Ibqa clan member named Hussein Kamal Jafar have demanded a one million ransom in exchange for his release, after which the Jafar clan abducted eight people in retaliation and released one of them overnight. A Lebanese sheikh escaped an assassination attempt in the northern city of Tripoli. National news agency says an unknown gunman opened fire on Sheikh Salem al rifai as he was ex exiting the al taqwa mosque last night. Bullets hit the doors of the mosque, but Rifai managed to escape the attack unharmed. On another note, Beirut examining magistrate Judge Hassan Awaidat issued arrest warrants against the seven suspects involved in the attacks against four sheikhs in Beirut. Four of the suspects are accused of assaulting two Dar al Fatwa clerics, Sheikh Mazen Hariri and Sheikh Ahmed Fakhran, in Khanda al Rami in Beirut. The remaining three are suspected of attacking two other sheikhs, Omar al Imami and Ibrahim Abdel Latif, in Shia. The military appeals court has ordered the release on bail of a man suspected of involvement in a deadly attack on the army in Arsel. The national news agency says the court's presiding judge, Alice Shabtini, ordered the release of Nafal al hujairi on a one million Lebanese pound bail. The ruling came despite a request by military examining magistrate Fadi Sawan to uphold the decision to keep him in custody. The NNA added that four other suspects have requested Sawan to order the release. Fighting between Syrian rebels and loyalist troops have raged in two areas in Damascus neighborhoods. The Syrian Ob Observatory for Human Rights said the shelling of a village near the capital left four members of a family dead. The watchdog added shelling on Hajar al-Aswat in southern Damascus killed at least three men and wounded more than 20 civilians. Today's violence comes a day after at least 150 people were killed, among them 69 civilians, 44 rebels and 37 loyalist troops. 
Violence has escalated in, in Damascus in recent weeks as the army battles to push back insurgents seeking to penetrate the capital. And coming up next, former U.S. President Jimmy Carter says China is putting pressure on Nepal to interrupt the flow of Tibetan, ref Tibetan refugee into the Himalayan nation. Stay with us for more. Welcome back. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas blames the government of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for the death of a prisoner suffering from terminal cancer. Abu Hamdi, 64, died at Soroka Hospital in the southern Israeli, uh, in the southern Israeli city of Beersheba earlier today. Officials said he was suffering from terminal throat cancer. The Palestine Liberation Organization also lashed out at Israel, accusing the Jewish state of a premeditated crime against humanity and warning that more ill prisoners could die. Abu Hamdiye, who was arrested in 2002 and sentenced to life in jail, began complaining of throat problems about nine months ago and was subsequently diagnosed with cancer. Veteran Hamas leader Khalid Mash'al was elected for a new term as head of the Palestinian Islamist movement of Hamas. A party official said there had been speculation that Mash'al, who was based in exile, would be forced aside by the movement's powerful leaders in the Gaza Strip. Mash'al himself had said last year that he would not seek a new term. Sources said that the party's governing Shura Council re-elected him for another four years at a meeting in Cairo last night. Hamas officials were in Cairo for the vote and also to discuss reconciliation with the rival Fatah faction led by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas with Egyptian leaders. And the United States has accused Egypt of muzzling freedom of speech after prosecutors questioned the most popular Egyptian television satirist, Bassem Youssef, over allegations he insulted President Mohamed Mursi and Islam. Youssef, who rose to fame with a satirical online show after the uprising that swept autocrat Hosni Mubarak from power in 2011, turned himself in on Sunday after the prosecutor general issued an arrest warrant for the comedian last week. We are concerned that the public prosecutor appears to have questioned and then released on bail Basim Youssef on charges of insulting Islam and President Morsi. This, coupled with recent arrest warrants issued for other political activists, is uh, evidence of a disturbing trend of growing restric restrictions on the freedom of expression. The new non-governmental organizations uh or let's say civil society. Uh, as I said last Thursday, we're also concerned that the government of Egypt seems to be investigating these cases uh, while it has been slow or um, inadequate in uh, investigating attacks on demonstrators outside of the presidential palace in December 2012, other cases of extreme police brutality, uh, and illegally uh, blocked entry of journalism, journalists to media cities. So there does not seem to be an even-handed application of justice here. North Korea says it will restart all nuclear facilities at its main complex, Yongbyon complex, in the latest move which is likely to escalate further tensions with South Korea and the United States. A local news agency says plans have been announced to rebuild and restart the uranium enrichment facility and the 5MW Yongbyon reactor, which has been closed in 2007. Reports added the readjusting and restarting of nuclear facilities will be used for electricity shortages and military development. The move was made in, a, in line with a policy of bolstering the nuclear armed force, both, both in equality and quantity, as well as solving acute electricity shortages. On another note, the United States has taken North Korea's war threats seriously, but says it has not seen any sort of large-scale mobilization of Pyongyang's troops. I would note that despite the harsh rhetoric we're hearing from Pyongyang, we are not seeing changes to the North Korean military posture, such as large-scale mobilizations and positioning of forces. Now, we take this seriously. I've said that in the past. Uh, and we are vigilant and we are monitoring the Korean situation uh, very diligently. The actions we've taken are prudent, uh, and they include on missile defense to enhance both the homeland and allied security, and other actions like the B-2 and B-52 flights have been important steps to reassure our allies, demonstrate our resolve to the north, and reduce pressure on Seoul to take unilateral action. Uh, and we believe this has reduced the chance of miscalculation and provocation.
And now for a quick look at other news around the world. Chipriot President Nikos Anastasiadis says even his own relatives and himself should be investigated as three retired judges are sworn in to lead an investigation into the island's banking crisis. The, gov the government announced it, had, it was appointing the judges to an investigation committee that will have a broad scope to look, to look into the affairs of politicians and top bank officials. It will also look into who is to blame for bringing the country's finances to their current state. A drunken man has climbed onto a utility pole and dangled from the high-tension cables nine meters above the ground in downtown Linfen in North China. The man moved along the cables totally unaware of the danger. The fire department immediately cut off the power supply to the area to prevent the man from being electrocuted. The man finally fell onto layers of cables under the eyes of horrified onlookers. Medical staff said the, the man sustained no injuries except the excessive alcohol in his body. Thirteen children have been killed after a fire had engulfed an Islamic school dormitory in Myanmar city of Yangon. The incident appears to have been caused by an electrical fault. The building housed a mosque and a religious school where children were staying while taking a summer class. The children, all boys, died of suffocation and police officer says the fire was triggered by an overheated inverter and wasn't due to any criminal activity. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter says China is putting pressure on Nepal to interrupt the flow of Tibetan refugees into the Himalayan nation. In the past, Tibetan exiles captured by Nepali police were handed to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees for their onward journey to India, where the Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, lives in exile. However, Carter says Tibetan exiles are now facing harassment at the border and calls on the government to resist pressure to impede the movement of refugees. The former president, whose Carter Center observed Nepal's last elections in 2008, arrived last week to encourage political parties to conduct delayed national elections and to push forward a peace process following the war. I, I, I believe that, that, that the Tibetan refugees should be welcomed. There has been, as you know, a tacit agreement in the past that uh, refugees coming out of Tibet would not be um, abused when they arrive here, and there's a fairly large uh, population of Tibetan refugees here. Uh, lately, I understand at the border there has been some harassment of people coming from Tibet uh, to Nepal. Uh, the Chinese government is putting pressure on the officials in Nepal to interrupt this uh, movement of people. I think they should have a right to go where they wish. I've been disappointed at the failure of the parliament to complete the work on the constitution. I look on this present arrangement as temporary. It's just a one-time uh, emergency arrangement in order that, it can, that the elections can be held. Uh, I think there's a general feeling in Nepal, which I share, that the election will not be held in June and would have to be held after the monsoon period, which would be probably, possibly in, in November. This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our top stories. Interior Minister Medwan Shedbin says he needs six months of preparations for the polls if there was consensus on a new law. The military appeals court orders the release on bail of a man suspected of involvement in a deadly attack on the army in Arcel. And finally, fighting between Syria's rebels and loyalist troops rage in two Damascus neighborhoods. Those were your Tuesday top stories from Future TV, live from Beirut. I'm Linda Tamim, and I'll be back again tomorrow for more updates. Have a great evening till then. وغادر اليوم وانا مرتاح الضمير